Hello Highgrove. I feel really privileged to be able to speak to you at the end of the week of prayer and fasting that we've had across the whole of the group of churches. It's been great to stand together to pray for our congregations and our city and our wider world. Today I'm thinking about what it means to refresh our souls in God instead of the other distractions that can come our way. And I'm going to read to you from Psalm 42 verse 5 which says this, Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Saviour and my God. Now, a couple of years ago in January at Woodlands, we did a preaching series based on a book by John Ortberg called Soul Keeping. And we were looking at soul care. And I suppose one of the things that um, it's hard to define a little bit exactly what do we mean by our soul. In the psalm and in the, the verse that I've just read, it feels as if the, the psalmist is speaking to himself. Why are you downcast, O oh my soul? It's as if his reflective or... Um, observing self is speaking to something else uh, and encouraging that soul to seek God. And I suppose our soul encompasses not just our kind of rational mind, but our whole feeling nature, our whole choosing nature, our whole personality. It's that kind of inner life which is distinct from the, from the physical life or even from that kind of rather rational, detached self that many of us are aware of that we have. And the soul, this, this inner self, is, is not something that you can kind of find or um, scientific scrutiny kind of um, analysis in a laboratory will, will not reveal a soul to you. And yet we experience what it means to be soulful beings, beings who have deep longings, um, passions, uh, the highs and lows of life, the, the way that we engage with our world. And with not just the physical world, but with the whole emotional and spiritual world as human amphibians, spiritual and social creatures, we, we engage with our souls, that, that, that inner self life. And our inner self, I would suggest, um, needs nurture and care as much as our external physical body. In Psalm 42, the psalmist seems to refer to some highs and lows. Let me read you some more. He says this. Well, I'll start from the beginning, actually. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Where can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night. Well, men say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I used to go with the multitude, leading the procession to the house of God, with shouts of joy and thanksgiving among the festive throng. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Saviour and my God. My soul is downcast within me, therefore I will remember you. And it goes on to talk about deep calls to deep, and all your, your breakers have broken over me. Our souls, I believe, are made for fellowship with God and fellowship with human beings. And actually, our relationships with one another can be soulful. I don't know whether you've ever looked at somebody with deep and soulful eyes or felt them looking at you that way. You felt like, oh, this human being, I'm engaging with them at, at, at a deeper level, that, that, uh, and the eyes being the window of the soul. We, we kind of talk about hidden depths that people have. We kind of have in our, in our popular imagination understanding this sense there is this, this soul within us that can be known and connected with. And I believe that in that desire for connection that we all have, we can also miss connection by not nurturing our soul, by pursuing things that are distractions rather than positives. Now, if it's true that our soul is a, uh, that, that covers the feeling and emotional part of us, it's not surprising that on the inside, that's where we can experience and relate to the highs and lows of life. We are not kind of robots. We're not detached, rational beings. We are feeling as well as thinking uh, beings. And God actually is a feeling as well as a, um, 
a rational entity. The, the Greek view of God, actually, can sometimes diminish the feeling nature that the Bible reveals to us about God. For the Greeks, God was an unmovable mover, someone who was dispassionate, wasn't subject to passions or feelings like mortals, and who stood somewhat aloof from the universe, the, the, the kind of almost like a, a scientific principle rather than a, a feeling personality. But the God of the Bible is a very personal God, a God who reveals himself to us as a God who feels pain, right back in the book of Genesis, a God who, who can um, feel emotion over his people, who can weep and rejoice over us, a God who can sing over us, actually. And uh, Jesus, of course, revealing God to us, reveals himself in a deeply emotional way, as well as a, a, a profound and philosophical and... Um, intellectual way if you like. Jesus is also the man of sorrows, the one who weeps over Jerusalem, the man who is full of joy in the Holy Spirit. And as we relate to God, it's important that we relate to him with our feeling self as well as just our dry, um, rational, believing self. The, the, the call on our lives is, is to fellowship with God, to have intimacy with God, to love God with all our heart and all our soul and all our mind and all our strength. But our souls that are made for love, made for fellowship, made for relationship, made for interaction, our social souls, can actually be very brought down by the, the challenges and vicissitudes of life, and very elated as well. And some of us are kind of more volatile than others in our soul. Some people seem to be really steady, others of us, we really do, we're impacted by life, we experience the highs and lows. And the question is, what do we do when we're impacted? I, I think... David, actually, the, 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 the chief psalmist, and whose life we know so well, is someone who was highly impacted by life. He's a man after God's own heart. We know that he was a man who um, yeah, could be impacted by social relationships, by friendships, his deep relationship with Jonathan, some of his really loving relationships, but also the, the impulsive uh, emotional response and physical response to Bathsheba. You know, we, we know that he was affected by relationships. We know that... Um, he was somebody who could mourn deeply. He, he longed for his son Absalom, but mourned dreadfully over his death. Um, he was somebody who, yeah, he was a passionate man. And that's reflected in, in his worship too, I think. We see him as a passionate worshipper. And so many of the Psalms also document the highs and lows of life. And if you're someone who experiences the highs and lows of life, maybe you're someone who could experience actually what it means to, to live life fully. But the challenge is, do we sometimes avoid getting our help from God because it's so easy for our soul to find refuge in other things? I've been thinking a little bit about fasting and prayer this week, as I've, I'm actually currently fasting at the moment. And, and in the words of John Wimber, I don't know why they're calling fasting, because it always goes really slowly. When your day hasn't got preparation of food and eating of food and um, clearing up food, you've got a lot more time, which is great. And I also I think when you're fasting, your body is alerting you all the time. You don't forget that you're in an altered state. And it can when, when you wanted to give yourself to prayer, your body reminds you, ah, you should be praying right now, or this is a special season when you're devoting yourself to God. But is it very comfortable to fast? I kind of think of comfort eating, and I've never felt that comfort fasting was something that was going to be good for my soul. And yet perhaps it is. Because when my soul um, thinks, oh, I'm feeling rubbish at the moment. I want to cheer myself up. I'm going to have a little, maybe a little glass of wine right now, or I'm going to reach for the chocolate, or maybe I'll get some fast food, because that will be a quick hit. So often, actually, our souls can, can be um, distracted by the quick hit of comfort for our appetites. Isn't it interesting that we feed our body when we should be nurturing our soul? Another thing we can do with our soul is, is look for the distraction of the cerebral part of that inner life. So I can try and find a great book to read, I can watch a film, there'll be something cerebral that distracts me. 
for some people, you know, sexual pressure and sexual temptation is also a, a, something that's, that is, is a soul area, a soul conflict. I think that our, uh, our whole romantic and sexual nature isn't too far off from this nature that wants to give, to pour itself out, to long, that actually is um, at its best something that can point us to our love for God, but it's, at its worst could be a real distraction for it, as it was in the life of David. For David, when the time of the kings was there and he should have been with his um, armies, he was at home and he had time on his hands. And his soul um, alighted, or his eyes alighted at least, on a beautiful woman, and we know where that story led. So for us, how can we avoid indulging the physical, or being distracted in the cerebral rather than bringing our whole selves towards God. It's about worship, I think. Worship is a great antidote to the other distractions of life. And I think that for, for David as a worshipper, for him, it was seeking God in that self-giving and that understanding that God himself, as we give ourselves to him, gives himself to us, that he really found his help. Now, there are times in David's life where he could have felt immense self-pity. And in 1 Samuel 30, verse 6, there's, a, there's a, a passage where it talks about David strengthening himself in the Lord. Now, the context of that is where um, David, who's been with his men, uh, building uh, a place of... Um, strength and refuge in the struggle with Paul. There's a raiding party that comes and actually takes David's wife and the wives of the, of the hundreds of men that are with him, ransacks the camp, takes off the booty. And, and David um, is subject to a lot of criticism from his followers. When you've been trying to survive, when you're trying to hold on to the promises that God's given to you, when things go really wrong for you, and then you're also subject to criticism, it's pretty heavy duty for the soul. David has experienced in this context his own loss. And, and also he's experiencing that the, the harsh criticism from the people he's been trying to lead and nurture. But it says there that instead of feeling self-pity, instead of being distracted, he strengthened himself in the Lord. He went to God and inquired of him. When we're down, do we go away from God and seek some comfort? Or do we go to God and seek to push into him? Now that's not always easy because it can take energy seeking God. But we know the outcome is so different. You know how rubbish we feel where we've been seeking false comfort. And when we've indulged ourselves in that way, or we've gone for the distraction, at the end of it, what are we left with? Whereas if we seek God and put energy into him, our soul actually finds it is strengthened to face the things that are making us feel downcast. And I really want to commend spiritual disciplines and worship as a way of finding that we can find an antidote when our souls are downcast. It's interesting, again, in Psalm 42, that the, that the, the psalmist remembers worship at a place where he's at his most downcast. He says, I remember when I was with the, the throng with the procession. Now it might be that for you right now, um, the effects of lockdown, social distance, your inability to join in the throng makes you downcast. And that's one reason why we want to encourage you to participate, to give yourself to worship. Join with us in our, our online worship experiences, such as you're partaking in today if you're watching this. But have you been able, during the nine months that we've been in the grip of pandemic, to strengthen yourself to the Lord by cultivating worship in your secret place, in the secret place of your heart. That's what Jesus commands in Matthew chapter 6, where he talks about praying in secret before the Lord, giving in secret, forgiving people in secret, giving something which is done for the sake of God and gets a reward from him, an increased capacity for him. If we can turn to God instead of turning to other comforts, our capacity for God will increase. If we turn to other things, it may be that our capacity for God 
decreases and we become spiritually unfit. I've got to say that um, that's my experience. I'm somebody who, I guess I, I'm somebody who's, you know, the appetites, I relate quite a lot to Esau, you know. <laughs> oh, give me something good to eat. But I also know what it's like to feel um, hungry for God. And instead of turning for the quick fix of a physical comfort or a cere cerebral distraction, to comfort myself in God. Honestly, I feel better when I've devoted myself to God. And my spirit, which is plateaued or saw other things, becomes alive. It becomes tuned in to the voice of God instead of the other distracting voices that can come my way. And at the end of prayer week, if you've found that you've strengthened yourself through some of those spiritual disciplines, certainly of prayer, maybe of extra worship time, maybe of devotional reading, maybe even of fasting, I want to commend to you as you go into January uh, 2021 and beyond to keep strengthening yourself in God. This year is going to bring challenges for all of us, no doubt. We're going to face some tricky weeks and months ahead. And we could feel full of self-pity. We could feel depressed and isolated. Let's not neglect um, the spiritual opportunities that fellowship life, even if it's online, offers us. But let's, in our inner life, in our choosing self, keep choosing to turn to God, to go to him, to press into him, rather than finding distractions that turn us away from him. I'd love to pray with you, for myself and for all of us, as I finish. Father God, you've made us creatures with souls, people that can pour ourselves out into all kinds of things and all kinds of relationships, people who can experience the highs and lows of life. Thank you, Jesus, you shared our nature, you understand that. But you, Lord Jesus, yourself, were someone who was full of the Holy Spirit, who, in the challenging times, went to God and went to your relationship with the Father and told us to do the same. And Lord, we want to refresh ourselves in you. Lord, will you help us when we're tempted or distracted to recognise what's going on, to recognise our need for our souls to be cared for. In Jesus' name. Amen.